Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Robbie Lockie, co-founder and co-director of Plant Based News. Welcome to another very special episode live here on YouTube. Today, we're joined by the amazing Dr. Melanie Joy. She is a Harvard-educated psychologist specializing in the psychology of eating animals, social transformation, and relationships. She is widely recognized as a thought leader and is best known for her pioneering work developing her theory of carnism. Dr. Joy is an award-winning author of six books, including Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows. And she's also an internationally recognized speaker and trainer who's presented her work in 50 countries across six continents. I can personally attest to her amazing work because I've been on many of her workshops myself and have benefited from them thoroughly. So let's bring in Melanie. Welcome, Melanie. Welcome to the, uh, welcome to the channel. Hi, Robbie. Oh, thank you for such a lovely introduction. And it's so good to see you. And thank you for the conversation today. I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's great to uh, sit down with you and talk to you about such an important subject, something that is, uh, well, really dear to me and really the kind of fundamental reason why I got involved in the vegan community, because, um, you know, creating change and uh, bringing a, a kinder, more compassionate world into reality is going to take um, efficiency and effectiveness. And this is what we're going to talk about today. So I'm really excited. We're going to speak to answer your question, probably speak about 25 minutes or so. We've got a bunch of talking points we're going to go through. But most importantly, I wanted to talk about and mention to everyone today that something really exciting is happening in Washington, D.C. on the 20th uh, of October through to the 23rd of October. And that is the amazing um, Animal and Vegan Advocacy Summit. Uh, and you're going to be speaking there. We're obviously supporting it here over at PBN. You guys, if you are really interested in this summit, summit we're going to talk a lot about it. You can check out avasummit.com forward slash PBN, and you can actually use the voucher code PBN100 to get a whole $100 off your ticket as well. But we're going to dive into that. But before we do, obviously, would love to learn a bit more about your work, Melanie, um, and learn uh, some of the audience who may not have um, heard about your work really kind of just deep dive into what you're working on at the moment and what are the kind of projects that you're involved in specifically things like beyond carnism sure sure thank you yeah so for for people who are not familiar with my work um my my best known book is why we love dogs eat pigs and wear cows um which is on the psychology of eating animals that's really what my i was i was motivated to understand this after having eaten animals for all of my life at that point. I was 23 years old in 1989. And um, I got sick. I'll just tell you quickly about, you know, my story. I, I got sick from eating a contaminated hamburger. I stopped eating animals after that because I was just disgusted. And I was learning about my new diet, which was, um, you know, vegetarian at the time. And what I learned shocked and horrified me. Um, I, I just couldn't believe the extent of the harm to animals and the environment and also, you know, human health actually um, caused by animal agriculture. And so, um, but when I was telling people about what I was learning, nobody was willing to hear what I had to say. They'd say things like, don't tell me that you'll ruin my meal, or they'd call me a, you know, radical vegetarian hippie propagandist and so on. So this led me to become really, really curious about why, you know, rational caring people would just like shut down the conversation when it came to eating animals, just stop thinking and feeling when it came to this critical issue. And that led me to, um, you know, enroll in a doctoral program eventually in psychology. And I wrote, I studied the psychology of violence and nonviolence broadly, um, which expanded into in later years into the psychology of oppression or injustice and also social transformation. Um, but I focused my uh, research on the psychology of eating animals. And that was what led me to identify carnism, the invisible belief system that conditions us to eat anim certain animals. And, um, and then I published my book, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows. And there was um, the, the book hit a chord and became, you know, quite popular among, among vegans, vegetarians, and, and also non-vegans, surprisingly. Um, so that led me to um, found my organization, Beyond Carnism. Um, our mission, we're an international NGO. Our mission is to expose and transform carnism globally. And we do this through a two-pronged strategic approach. We work to raise awareness of carnism. With awareness, people can make choices or better positioned to make food choices that reflect what they authentically think and feel rather than what they've been conditioned to think and feel. Um, 
So we work to expose to carnism um, and we also work to strengthen veganism, you know, and we do this through primarily through our Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy. Um, my first book actually is Strategic Action for Animals, and it's really about how we can make choices as people who want to create a better world for, for animals that are, are as impactful and effective as possible. And so through SIVA, we work to um, you know, increase the impact of vegan advocacy worldwide. So we provide trainings on a variety of topics, most notably effective communication, um, healthy relational or interpersonal dynamics. Um, these are at the foundation of effective advocacy and also building effective, they're also at the foundation of building effective and strong organizations and a resilient vegan movement. Um, we also talk about the science of effective vegan advocacy, you know, what works, what doesn't work, how do we know, how to assess what works and what doesn't work. Um, and, um, and most recently, um, I have been, I've done a deep dive into all things infighting and have, um, put together uh, a new workshop that I'll be um, uh, presenting at the EVA Summit on infighting, which I'm, I'm really excited about. So, so this is really what I work on. This is the foundation of, of what I do and what we work on. And, and beyond this, my um, other sort of areas of, uh, of work and, and books that I have written focused on um, how to have healthy, how to build healthy relationships. My other hat is as a relationship coach, essentially, how to relate and communicate effectively. Um, and also, you know, understanding the psychology that doesn't just cause us to harm other animals, but also other humans and how this same mentality that drives us to harm animals drives us to, to harm humans. So how can we be as effective as possible, whatever our cause is that we're working for, how can we make sure we work toward this mission without throwing others under the bus and harming other causes in the process. Amazing, really exciting stuff. And as I said in the intro, I've done your courses. In fact, I uh, attended several and they have been, it's hard to really put it into words, really, the foundation of my work here at PBN. It's really helped me in my relationships with people I work with, the contributors that I work with, but also to help me maintain a good um, mental health and build really strong resilience in what I'm doing because what we're doing for that matter, because it's uh, as a movement, it's a very, very challenging space to work within. It's incredibly overwhelming when we look out into the world today and we see everything that goes on in the world when it comes to um, you know, animals particularly, but also the, the broader world, the human world. You know, it's, very, it's a world filled with suffering and sometimes we can become overwhelmed by that. But if we find ourselves in a place where we're not overwhelmed and we can take action, it's about taking effective action. And something like the AVA Summit, which is a conference dedicated to creating a world in which animals are taken out of the food system and other human uses by inspiring advocates and empowering them to be more impactful, as to be as impactful as, po impactful as possible. And that's the really the real crux of it for me is it's all very well wanting to get involved in advocacy and activism, but being, act being an activist or being a campaigner or being an advocate, um, it's really important to be effective isn't it i'd love to hear a little bit from you about let's talk about like effective vegan advocacy what does that actually mean um from from the context of the summit but also the broader context of of effective advocacy yeah that's a great question and you're so right and you know so often and i you know when i first became an activist as well um those of us who are activists or advocates you know we kind of like we're, we're doing this work because we feel the urgency of our mission. And we're just, we want to do, with there's so much energy and so much commitment, and we want to do whatever we can to end animal exploitation now. And, um, but what we don't get is any training whatsoever on how to do this effectively. And, um, you know, we get more training to operate a cash register than we do trying to change the world. It's like, you know, it's really striking. And, and a lot of what we feel intuitively is the right way to work for change is actually not not the most effective way to work for change, work toward change. And so by effective, you know, the, the, the question that I would ask, you know, is how can you do, this is what effective altruism looks at, looks at as well, you know, how can we use our efforts to have the greatest positive impact possible? And this, you know, we 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 um, apply this question. We would we would ask this question when it comes to like you know what should I do first of all like what kind of activism or advocacy makes sense to engage in for me you know what are what is what is my skill set what brings me joy what is sustainable for me, but also you know whatever method you choose whether it's street activism or whether 
you know, you want to open up a restaurant, you want to join an organization. It's also important to, you know, look at the methodology. And a lot of what I look at is, um, you know, advocacy. There are, you know, carnism is unfortunately, as you know, somebody is writing in here, it's, it's all around us. Um, you know, more animals are slaughtered for, you know, their flesh and other body parts in a single day than the total number of people killed in all wars throughout history. I mean, it is everywhere. It is a multifaceted problem all around the world, institutionalized. So we need to come at this from a lot of different angles. We need political lobbying. We need grassroots activism. You know, we need businesses to change their business models and so on and so forth. Um, Whatever we choose to do with our time and energy, however, it makes sense for us to be able to, or, or I would say we need to be, make sure that we're able to communicate our message in a way that increases the chances that will be it, the message will be heard as we intend it to be. So advocacy, and I would say even communication, you know, is that effective communication is at the foundation of pretty much every strategy or change method that we use. Um, and if we can af communicate effectively, um, it's it's really going to be a huge, you know, we, we can actually end up being counterproductive. And, you know, studies have shown that what doesn't convince people to change or what doesn't open people's minds, you know, to an issue tends to reinforce their existing beliefs. So every time we advocate, meaning, you know, you asked about effective vegan advocacy, effective vegan advocacy is communicating to raise awareness of and garner support for veganism in a way that's as impactful as possible. Every time we communicate in a way that is, um, not reaching people, and some people just aren't reachable, right? But every time we communicate in a way that is not helping people open their hearts and minds, we are potentially increasing the chances that they're wedded to their position and even more resistant and defensive against what we have to say. So effective even vegan advocacy is really a template in, from, my, from my mind. It's a template for, for working in a way that takes into account so many kind of variables, but it does it in such a way that it allows you to create a manageable outcome. Because I think, you know, a lot of people, there's a few people in the comments and I, I myself have experienced burnout, have experienced overwhelm. Someone mentioned something in the comments, Vitopia, Vistopia? Vistopia. Vistopia. Mm -hmm. A Vistopian um, feeling. How do we, how do we avoid this because obviously you know human beings are naturally empathic emotional compassionate beings i believe and it's very easy for us to take on all the sufferings of the world and then end up becoming incredibly ineffective because we're feeling too much we're soaking ourselves in the suffering of of, uh, of all sentient beings how do we avoid yeah. that? <laughs> I mean, it's a it's a great question. And this is all, you know, um, I would say there's sort of an umbrella approach to uh, all of these different issues that are important for us to manage if we want to be as effective as possible in our advocacy. Um, we, you know, apart from like learning, like the science, right, we have a new at SIVA, we have a new course coming out, we have digital courses, um, and we have a new course coming out called the Science of Effective Vegan Advocacy. And, you know, this is very straightforward. It's like, what does the science and say works. When we look at change methods, what do we know works and what do we know um, tends to be counterproductive, right? So just, you know, quick example, shaming communication. Communication that is, um, that other people experience as shaming is highly correlated with bringing about the opposite outcomes of what we want. And this is also one of the most common ways that people tend to communicate, not just vegans. You know, we've been born into this like very dysfunctional world as many people listening here, no doubt are aware. And none of us have really been given, most of us have been given no formal training whatsoever in how to relate and communicate in a way that's effective and opens people up to our message. And we just kind of default to, well, if I can make you feel bad enough about what you do, ashamed enough about what you do, then, you know, you're going to feel so bad, you're going to want to change your ways, except this tends to backfire and cause people to get even more entrenched in their existing beliefs. So, um, under, so apart from just like learning the basics of like, you know, what works and what doesn't work, it's really important to, for, for advocates or for anyone to learn what I call uh, relational literacy. Relational literacy is, or to build relational literacy. Relational literacy is the understanding of and ability to practice healthy ways of relating. And this is something, it is not rocket science. It is something that can be learned. I have an entire book called Getting Relationships Right. It's a one-stop guide on building relational literacy. We have a lot of resources on SIVA, but 
the point that I'm making is that when you build relational skills and relational skills, building relational skills means building effective communication skills. Communication is the primary way we relate. When you build your relational skills, you basically, you build your resilience, you know, your, your psycho-emotional resilience um, so that you're less likely to suffer from dystopia, right? You're less likely to become misanthropic. You're less likely to become traumatized by having witnessed the, you know, the, the atrocity that's animal agriculture, the atrocity that is carnism. Studies have shown that people who are in healthy, fulfilling, connected relationships fare better in pretty much every aspect of life. They are less at risk. They're less likely to develop psychological problems such as anxiety and depression. Um, they are less likely to develop physical certain physical diseases. They're more likely to find success at what they do. People who have healthy connections with others are people who are much more likely to be able to resist, you know, or not burn out, first of all. Um, you know, you had you had mentioned burnout. So let me just speak quickly about you know, when you say dystopia, what I talk about, I think that's Claire, Claire Mann's word, her book. It's very, very interesting. Um, a lot of vegans uh, do suffer from secondary traumatic stress. This is the traumatization, um, which is the, the traumatization that is um, caused by living and being aware of in the, in the midst, uh, being aware of this global atrocity that is carnism. Many of us have witnessed horrible, graphic, traumatic suffering, and it's very hard not to take this in. And we need to build our resilience. We need to build our resilience. And what that means is we need to commit to, you know, creating healthy relationships in our lives, because that's one of the best ways to stay resilient, create a healthy relationship with ourselves, give ourselves permission not to look at that graphic imagery, um, give ourselves permission not to witness. If you have already seen this, you know what's going on, you know what's happening to the animals, do not expose yourself to more of it. I mean, this is one of the very simple things that we can do. But so many people don't do it because they don't feel like they have permission not to do it. Stop witnessing. Don't give other people, don't, you know, don't tell other vegans, for example, about the horrible things that you've witnessed and cause them to be, you know, traumatized as well. Really protect your boundaries and really commit to taking care of your needs mm. and practicing a lot of compassion toward yourself. I'm interested in the, uh, what you mentioned about the sort of traumatizing oneself by watching more and more, um, sort of violent footage do you feel like there's a connection there between people and you might you, you would be a psychologist that people's sense of guilt of being part of a very uh, violent system investing in it by consuming animal products and so th there's a part of people that continues to watch this stuff because they feel guilty they feel they feel responsible and they want to sort of in a part of in in many ways it's like a self it's like flagellation isn't it it's interesting that you say that, Robbie. I mean, there are certainly high levels, high rates of uh, survivor, survivor guilt in our movement. Survivor guilt is the guilt that people feel when they've survived mm -hmm. um, a, a tragedy, you know, or a traumatic event that other others have not survived. And when we feel survivor guilt, it's irrational. We feel guilty for being alive. And it makes us feel like we don't have a right to feel good. You know, and you can see the way that this gets carried out. It's like, you know, many vegans will, um, you know, say like, I feel like I just can't stop. Like I have to be, I have to constantly be active because it's not like, you know, the slaughter doesn't stop. Therefore I shouldn't stop. They don't, or they'll say, I start to feel guilty for feeling good. I'll be, right. you know, at a dinner and I'll be relaxing and hanging out with my family and friends and thinking like, I don't have a right to feel this way. Like I'm so lucky not to be being tortured right now in a slaughterhouse. Mm -hmm. I should be out there doing everything I can do. And so this is what I mean about how what feels intuitively right for us is often not the case because the one most important thing that we can do for this cause, or I should say one of the most important things we can do for this cause is to take really good care of ourselves, protect our boundaries, protect ourselves from overworking and from taking in more trauma so that we don't burn out and become embittered and become misanthropic so that we can be effective ambassadors for this cause and stay in it for the long haul. So, I mean, the good news is that giving yourself permission to take care of yourself and honor your needs and basically, 
you know, ask yourself every day, what do I need to feel in balance? Every day, ask yourself, do I feel in balance? You know, burnout is a life out of balance. And there's a lot of, you know, trauma and other, for other reasons as well, but for, because of the trauma in the movement, um, and a number of factors, and because vegans are people and people, you know, struggle with these things, many people are what's called dysregulated. Dysregulated is when, you know, you just, you feel unwell in yourself. It's your out of balance, right? Mm. So you might feel like kind of triggered. You might even not even know that you're dysregulated, but there's some sort of a charge, this energetic charge. Maybe somebody said something to you earlier in the day and you kind of like didn't address it. You let it go, but it's like still, it's still stuck there. Or maybe you've been too overstimulated and Mm. you have this raciness in you. You're dysregulated. There are lots of reasons for emotional dysregulation. Secondary traumatic stress is a big one. Being vegan itself can just cause us to get dysregulated. But for every single, every person listening here, every one of us, if you can commit pausing throughout your day at least once a day and asking yourself, do I feel dysregulated? Do I feel in balance? How do I feel? Where do I feel that feeling in my body? You get to know yourself. If you feel a tightness in your chest or like anxiety in your stomach or heaviness on your shoulders, pay attention to that. Give yourself permission to do what you need to get back into a state of regulation. You know yourself well. You're an expert on yourself. You've been living in your own skin for a long enough time. What do I need? Do I need to go in nature? Do I need to take a walk? I mean, we can't always do this, right? Mm -hmm. But for so many vegans, they don't even ask the question because they don't even know that they have the right to ask the question. Mm. There's a guilt there. And I think that's one of the the powerful kind of ways in which people stop personally. I've experienced it myself, the sense of taking time off or having a holiday. I feel guilty going on holiday. I feel like I should be at this computer 24 seven advocating for veganism because there's just not enough time. But at the end of the day, we need healthy, happy, effective people to, to grow the movement. But if you're just joining us, I'm Robbie, and this is Plant Based News Live here on YouTube. And we're talking to the amazing Dr. Melanie Joy, who's a psychologist and the founder of Beyond Carnism, an amazing organization. If you don't know what it is, please check out carnism.org. There's tons of wonderful resources on there. And of course, please also check out all of Melanie's uh, incredible work and books, too. Um, we're here talking about the AVA Summit. It is the Animal and Vegan Advocacy Summit. It's the first summit of its sort. Uh, there's a previously summits, previous animal rights summits um, that have happened in the past but this is a brand new summit with a new team and new uh, group of people behind it and if you are in washington dc or able to get to washington dc on the 20th of october through to the 23rd of october there is going to be over 80 amazing speakers and there's going to be vegan meals every day being served to you fun things going on talks from some of the most incredible people in the community um let's have a look there's leah garces genesis butler peter singer dawn moncrief tobias leanhart um people from all over the world coming to speak. So really, really excited. And of course, you can also get $100 off your ticket with PBN 100 if you go to avasummit.com forward slash PBN. So let's get back to the questions. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about uh, what you mentioned at the beginning, which is infighting. I've been involved in the vegan community for seven years, um, and I have experienced a wide gamut of people, of relationships, of situations. And one thing that has been common all the way along is the challenges that people face when they work together and infighting in my opinion as and you've have watched many of your talks on toxic communication can really um act as a as a huge sort of um just a, a massive weight around people's necks really and and the actual movement itself mm-hmm. so i'd love to hear a bit about your work around infighting and some of the things that you're doing uh to to kind of help educate and support people to move away from this type of behavior yeah, thanks, Robbie. And you you really, you, you explain it so well. I mean, it really does feel like for, for me, I've talked to so many thousands of vegans about this, and it does feel like such a weight around vegans' necks. And it's, <clears throat> it's hard. It's a very painful issue for many vegans who, you know, it's, it's hard enough for many people who are vegan, being part of that, you know, 1% of the world and, you know, having to like live in a da- dominant animal eating culture that just is like daily offends your, your deepest sensibility. And, you know, and then finding that the people who, you know, you feel share some of your deepest convictions, um, you know, are, are not on your side, you know, 
or are turning against you or turning against each other. And it's also very frustrating for vegans who are, you know, who, who do feel this sense of urgency because there is a sense of urgency to our work. And um, witnessing the very people who are supposed to be offsetting the problem, contributing to it and actually reinforcing it. It can be, it can be very, very off-putting. And I know many vegans feel anxious in the movement now. They feel, you know, sort of worried that they might be a target of attacks from other vegans. So, um, so what I wanted to, one thing I want to say is that infighting, it's, it's definitely a problem. It bleeds a tremendous amount of resources out of a movement that needs all the help it can get. There's no question about that. Um, and it is also understandable and inevitable um, when you really think about it, because as I said earlier, you know, most of us never get a single lesson in how to relate and communicate in a way that is effective. And it's hard enough for people to navigate their differences when their differences don't have to do with life and death. I mean, people, vegans are people and people haven't been given the tools and skills to to navigate their differences and their experiences in a way that's healthy and productive. And so very often, as soon as things get a little bit charged, even, you know, fighting can start happening. But the good news is that um, infighting, I believe, continues to be a problem and is the problem that it is because it's never actually been addressed, like really been addressed. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to like really look at the literature, really kind of do a deep dive and say, what exactly is infighting? You know, what are the key contributors to infighting? Okay. Okay. Here we are. We have a model here. We have like, you know, a, a framework for understanding this. Infighting is basically the same as outfighting, you know, which is fighting with people who are not within your in-group, except it affects, you know, or is directed toward members of your own group, your own in-group, this group with which you identify here, we're talking about vegans. And we have infighting in the movement in general, right? And, you know, among vegans in the movement, so abolitionist, welfarist, this is a very stereotypical example. Um, and then we have fighting within organizations. And a lot of what we see is infighting is actually, um, <clears throat> is, it's relational dysfunction. It's relating in a way that, you um, is relating in a way that is uh, bringing about the opposite outcomes of, of, of what we want. And so, um, sorry about this. I just got a little, I got a pop-up that said my session had ended and I thought I lost you guys, but it looks like we're still here. So, um, so, so the infighting in the movement in general, right? It tends to be, you know, sort of between advocates who are having, they have a difference of ideology, the difference about outreach methods. And the good news is that this like really broad level infighting tends to be, appears to be a, a vocal minority of vegans who are actively engaging in what are shaming or aggressive, you know, communication tactics against other vegans. And the, the problem is it exists on this, this broader level, you know, in inter, in, within organizations, infighting is, is sometimes it's having a very different idea about one's ideology, vegan ideology. But very often it's more relational dysfunction. People who don't know, don't have the tools um, to navigate their differences in a way that's productive, healthy, and effective. Um, but the good news is that the infighting, particularly like on this broader movement wide level, it, it's enabled by um, it's enabled by vegans who are not actively contributing to infighting, but they don't understand enough about what infighting is and is not to deplatform the people who are. So when we raise awareness enough among vegans in general, this is toxic. This is like, you know, so for example, you know, somebody is, is, is saying something about another vegan or is basically shaming vegans into using shaming tactics in order to try to get non-vegans to go vegan. Well, how do you assess the credibility of this information source? How do you determine if what this person is saying is actually true? Is, is it accurate and effective what they're actually saying? How do you assess this communication? Is this a relational communication or is this in fact an aggressive toxic communication? A lot of the infighting that we see is like, you know, some of it is actually so subtle that people don't realize that it is vegans attacking other vegans. So, so basically what um, I'm going to talk about at Ava is how to really understand this issue of infighting. What does it look like? How does it get expressed? What are some 
examples and manifestations of infighting that people often don't consider infighting that actually are. And, and how can we change this? How can those of us who really care and we don't want to fuel the fire of infighting in our movement, how can we stop? Um, and it's actually not, it's not rocket science. It's quite simple. And a, a lot of what we call infighting is actually in bullying. You know, it's not two people fighting. It's one person attacking somebody else who might be kind of like putting their hands up in self-defense, mm. but um, it's an important and very interesting topic. Mm, it really is mm. uh, interesting that you use the word bullying because I have experienced that myself. I think that the core of this, uh, you know, and I always refer to this when I talk to people, it's about effective communication. We have found ourselves in a world where social media is creating so much polarization between people. We are seem we are increasingly unable to sit down, well, sit down virtually with others via social media and able to have rational, calm conversations and have different opinions and views. And I think as vegan advocates, it's so important for us if we are, and for many, it's about operating online. It's about using the power of social media to advocate for veganism. If we aren't using um, effective vegan advocacy methods we're probably likely to be shooting ourselves in the foot we're we're probably quite likely to be holding back the message right i often say to people it's better to be effective than to be right you can be uh, i like to use the example of meat is murder for example as an example meat is murder as a as an expression is something that is incredibly uh emot emotively charged as vegans as vegan advocates as people who've been involved in the movement for years we understand the concept of animals being murdered because we see them as individuals. But most people out there who are not vegans, who've never had that made that connection with animals, they don't see animals as individuals like we do. Ergo, they don't understand the phrase meat is murder. And it immediately triggers them and makes them think that we are um, just crazy, mindless vegans who are out there trying to right. enforce our views. So it's so, so important for, our, for people that it's it's it comes... Most of the time when people advocate online, when they start, it comes from a place of impure emotion. And a statement like meat is murder is incredibly emotive. But what it ends up doing often is evoking the wrong reaction in the person we're talking to and immediately ends up, the conversation descends into what we talk about toxic communication, where two people are attacking each other. Many times the vegan is what can sometimes be seen as bullying the other person who's the meat eater. And so... This is when we start talking about shame. We've we've discussed shame often. And when that person feels shame, they're unlikely to be getting, you know, they are likely to be tapping into uh, that place of understanding and awareness. So this is such an important conversation. Um, we don't have tons of time left, but I just want to talk about some of the goals of AVA, the summit. So some of the key parts of this is movement building. It's about networking, bringing people together. It's about inspiring talks that bring forward movement and it's about reducing infighting and uniting bring people together we've had a pandemic we've had this huge separation of people what i felt particularly here in the uk we had huge momentum before the pandemic we had lots of groups of people lots of actions lots of um interesting kind of collaborative collaborations going on but then the pandemic happened it really fractured the movement in my opinion and i think that events like this are so vital to bring human beings together into one location where they can meet face to face have hopefully lively discussions, agree or disagree, uh, but do it in a way that um, is as meaningful and uh, and heartfelt as well. Um, so let's talk about sort of the, some of the best outcomes for the attendees, something like recharging batteries, you know, getting new ideas. What are some of the things that you hope people will take from this movement, from this, sorry, from this summit? Yeah, I mean, you already put it so well, just it's been a long time I mean, with the with the pandemic, especially, um, you know, we haven't all been together in a space to have productive conversations where we really deepen our understanding and broaden our understanding and form those those social connections and those networks that are just so essential for our sustainability. Um, you know, as I said earlier, it's 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 not easy being vegan in a dominant animal eating culture and forming healthy connections, especially with people, you know, who can understand what this is and and, you know, who can support you in the work you're doing mm. is is so important. We are greater than the sum of our parts. And, um, you know, there's there's no doubt about that. I'm very excited. There's I think there's going to be a lot of you know new learnings and very interesting conversations and people will come away. I know for me, you know, I came away from conferences when I was younger. I mean, really feeling like I was getting the tools I needed 
mm. and forming the connections I needed to be the activist I wanted to be. And without those earlier conferences, I don't think I could have done it. Mm, absolutely. I met Klaus at a conference. Klaus and I started Plant Based News together mm-hmm. and it is built, it's, it's grown into one of the largest platforms of its kind in the world in, in six years. And we met at a vegan conference called uh, Vegan Futures here in London. Uh, and this is where we began our work together. And I know people like Jean Bauer, cool. yourself, you mentioned that, Milo Runkel, who created Mercy for Animals, a Genesis Butler. These are all people, Earthling Ed, can't forget Earthling Ed, uh, have all been to conferences and events, bigger vegan events that have brought people together. So, yeah, I think hopefully this will be the first of many conferences of this sort. How can uh, people, before I let you go, how can people find you? Uh, what are all your sort of socials and links? Um, and how can people support your work specifically? Oh, great. Well, thank you, Robbie. Um, they can come to carnism.org. Um, that's our, our main website. We have a new video that um, was just launched, I think less than two weeks ago now, um, on uh, the impact of um, animal agriculture or the, the connection between animal agriculture and um, and uh and climate change. And it's a call for, for climate advocates to um, make animal agriculture a, pro- a climate priority. And we really need help pushing this video out as widely as possible. We are you know, completely dependent on charitable donations um, in order for us to continue. So of course, you know, that kind of support is always you know, very much, very much uh, appreciated. And we are a service organization. You know, we exist to serve this movement and uh, we have a lot of resources a lot of free resources come visit us and please avail yourself of of what we have to offer and if we can help you do this in, this incredibly important work more effectively you know that's the best thing that we can do it's just made me uh, remember and actually i promised class i'd ask you this question is um mm-hmm. the power of media cannot be understated for its effectiveness for um, unlocking the realization within people that the food system that they are a part of is incredibly damaging to the environment. It's bad for our health. And it's obviously very, very cruel. You've produced a number of videos that have reached millions of people that have helped them uh, raise awareness. The, the video mm-hmm. you're talking about is Kitten Gate, right? Where outrage, yeah. outrage, <laughs> outrage <laughs> climate scientists are being fed kittens for dinner, but they're actually not really being fed. But that's the sort of that's the hook, right? That's what gets people in and what gets people talking. What are your? Uh, is there a sort of like tried and tested method for creating this type of content? Have you got like a template, or is this sort of these ideas? You know, where do they come from? <laughs> My head. <laughs> um yeah this was uh the the videos the, the yeah the original plan was that this was going to follow the arc of the TED talk and the um a couple of other videos we have but uh I realized um you know after a couple of months of trying to make that happen it wasn't going to happen and I had to sort of start from scratch and so each time you know we make a video I'm the person who scripts the videos um you know I'm really sitting down and, and thinking about where is that in like I you know the, the the big question is like you know not how we can how can we get the facts to people the facts are out there you know but but people are resistant to those facts so how can we help reduce resistance to the facts that are already out there mm. and so you know we with kitten gate I came at that as you know from a a different, somewhat different angle than than usual, but we really felt that you know that it wasn't, it didn't make sense to make uh, a video about you know the statistics mm. alone. We wanted to get people thinking about why why is it that they disagree on the facts in the first place. It's very clever. Can you tell us a bit more about like how you put it all came together? Because obviously, I'll, I'll I'll play it after we speak. But I'm just interested oh, in how you. it all came, how it all came together. How it all came together in my head. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there were various iterations of the script, and the mm-hmm. first one was you know 12 and a half minutes long, which as wow. we know doesn't work. And the big challenge for me was, and always is when I'm writing videos. Um, is is how do I do justice to the issue, you know, and like really this this is com- trying to communicate fairly sophisticated, complicated information to people in a really short period of time, make sure that it's relatable and understandable and entertaining and engaging. And mm-hmm. so I really wanted to invite people. I wanted to I wanted to come up with something that would help people have a visceral experience immediately mm-hmm. that actually was an example of the concept that I was going to talk about so that they would have a, a lived experience of something that was going to be presented to them conceptually later so that they wouldn't have to connect too many dots conceptually because they would already know what that mm-hmm. feeling was. Mm-hmm. Um, and getting people to laugh, you know, which is always... <laughs> 
good. And Mel- Melanie, I was amazed at how many people who thought it was real. Like, I know. there were so many people in the comments on PBN commenting, saying, "Oh my, I can't believe this." The guy, the pres- the, t- the TV presenter, it was very convincing. <laughs> it's funny. I know, and people were saying that to me. They were like, first of all, I." You know, they're like, I can't believe he said this, this, and this to you. And I'm like, I wrote those lines for him to say to me. Like, wait, it's it was which made me really happy when they were saying that because it he, the actor did such a good job. Mm-hmm. You know, he it didn't sound like he was acting at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was it was really interesting. There were a lot of people who thought it was real, but I think it's because the attention span is so short. People didn't watch till oh. the end because in the oh, end, yeah. it's obviously not real. It is obvious. Whilst the video, the live, sorry, whilst your video is processing, I'm just putting it into the system. Um, have you got time for one question whilst we wait? One yeah, more of question course. from the audience. Okay, so uh, this person is a very big mom who says, "Do you think showing footage of slaughterhouses during effect during outreach is effective? Presuming the person is willing to watch." Yeah, it's a really good question. It's like the you know million dollar question, um, and the answer is it depends. So um, first of all, I do believe that many vegans, understandably, feel like we you know, people are so resistant to this information, but if they just get it, they just see how bad it is, they'll never be able to eat animals again. So we end up oversharing this information. Like it takes, I don't know, seconds for people to actually make that connection and see how horrible it is. So that's number one. Number two, there is no real substantial research demonstrating that people respond to this kind of imagery. Um, The one study that uh, was done that I know of um, was a number of years ago and it's inconclusive, but what the assumption was coming out of this was that people are probably more likely to be motivated to change by seeing images of sad animals, but not gory animals. So basically Mm -hmm. images of animals who are suffering, but who don't have blood on them and are being tortured. Um, But that, again, that's not conclusive. It makes sense to me though. It makes intuitive sense to me to be fair and, um, or to be honest. And, uh, I think whatever you do is it, whatever you want to show to people, you don't need to show a lot of this imagery and you can say, always get their consent and say, I'd like to show you this. And, you know, here it is. And you can say no, but this is why I think it's important for you to see it. Mm. Um, and keep it, keep it limited, let them decide, but it's really good not to just show the horror, but mm. also to show like the potential, mm. you know, because a lot of people can see the horror and then they're like, well, what's the point? There's mm. so much like, you know, what's the point? Why, why do I even want to begin here? Like not yeah. eating animals. I'm like one person. So it really, it's really important to like talk about, you know, what, the the positives of veganism. Mm -hmm. And I like to always use this quote from Eddie Lama, the activist Eddie Lama, who said when he saw, he said, you know, when he was exposed to this imagery, he was completely shocked. And he said, oh my God, you know, I'm just a drop in the bucket, you know, but I'm not going to eat any, I'm not going to eat animals anymore. I know animals are going to continue to suffer and die, but not because of me. Mm. And that matters to me. And I love that line and I always use it. And so oh, um, that's amazing. Yeah. The video has now loaded. Uh, I am going yeah. to let you go. I know you're a busy okay. lady and you've got a lot going on. So we'll play the video now. Thank you so much for joining us. It's always a pleasure. I could talk Thank to you, you for hours as always. Oh, but, uh, me too, Robbie. Me too. It's, I um, always love talking I'm, to you. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to seeing you in uh, Washington on the 20th as well. Yeah, I can't wait. All right. I'll amazing. see you soon. Thank you, everybody, Thanks. for tuning in. I hope to see you. Yeah. Bye. See you soon. Bye. Could this be the worst blow to the climate movement yet? Definitely one of the most bizarre and shocking images we've obtained from the Eco 27 Summit. Attendees are eating what they believe to be cream of chicken soup, normally delicious, right? When renowned climate scientist, Dr. Jay Kumari leaps to the podium and announces that he has swapped the chicken with kitten. We're talking baby cats here. He then starts chanting a phrase from a banner that reads hashtag don't throw up, which I'm sure plenty of people there did. Now, Kamari was removed by authorities, as he should have been, and has refused to comment, except to say, quote, denial is disgusting. Dr. Kumari, you are disgusting. The incident dubbed Kittengate is taking the internet by storm. Now, with Kamari unreachable, here to try to make some sense of this is Dr. Melanie Joy, the world's leading expert on the psychology of eating animals. Thanks for being here, Dr. Joy. Thanks for having me. You got it, so why? Why would Dr. Kamari, a well-respected scientist, 
basically force feed kittens to these poor, unsuspecting people. I, I, where did he get the kittens? Did he go to the pet stores and give me 10 kittens? Who made the soup? Well, well I, I don't think it's actually about the kitten. My guess no? is that kittens were probably just easier for Kamari to obtain. He could oh, just as well have served puppies or ponies. Uh, I mean. Oh, pony soup. That sounds just as horrifying. That doesn't explain why. Why go to this extreme? Yeah, well, Kamari has stated that climate advocates and scientists, policymakers uh, are, are being prevented from thinking rationally when it comes to animal agriculture and climate change. Okay, so... hold on, hold on, hold on. Animal agriculture and the climate? I mean, it's not like they were serving uh, d d d beef, right? I mean, they well, were, hold on, Doc, yes, hold on. They were, the, they, they were the, supposed the... to be serving chickens which, if I'm not mistaken, poultry has way less emissions per pound or serving. Yes, so th that's true. But there are lots of other protein sources that may have an even lower carbon footprint than chickens. So why just compare beef and poultry? Why not include beans or cats or dogs? Well, or... Wait, because, because, wait, hold on, what? Dogs are cats, Well, it what? seems clear that Kamari was trying to expose this irrational mentality of meat. He was trying to expose what's called carnism. It's the carnism. invisible belief system that conditions people to eat certain animals. Oh, okay, great. All right, so uh, another new woke social justice end all oppression term that no, progressives no, are gonna I mean, make us is, use. This is a and, bona fide term oh, used in the social sciences and- Okay, but, but like really? I mean like the, really, in, in, invisible belief system? What is it, are we, are we in the Matrix yeah. now? Or is Neo behind me? Well, actually, some people do liken carnism to the Matrix. Carnism is oh, the reason okay. we virtually never ask why we eat certain animals but not others, or why we eat any animals. And so this bias gets in the way of our ability to think rationally when determining which protein sources are most sustainable. All right, so the planet is warming up because we're biased against eating pets? Well, actually, no, we're biased toward eating non-pets. Well, most people are naturally averse to harming animals. The diner's reaction to eating kitten soup is their authentic reaction. It's um, very likely how they would feel about eating chicken soup, if not for the invisible bias. Okay, but eating meat is, is natural and it's necessary for biodiversity and for human health and the food chain and a million other reasons. Are these not indisputable facts? I think these are exactly the kinds of questions that Kumari wants climate advocates to be able to more rationally it's, address. Hold on, hold on one second. I'm getting told Kumari's finally broken his silence, so I guess we're gonna hear from him. Dr. Melanie Joy, thank you so much for- Don't throw- <laughs> Obviously, Kittengate is made up, but carnism is real. Carnism prevents us from seeing what's right in front of us. According to the UN and the IPCC, animal agriculture accounts for more greenhouse gas emissions than the entire transportation sector. That's all cars and flights combined. If we don't address this issue, we'll exceed international climate targets, even if all other sources of greenhouse gas emissions are eliminated. Animal agriculture is also one of the leading causes of water pollution and deforestation. More farmed animals are killed in one day than the total number of people killed in all wars throughout history. Just because some people need to eat animals, this doesn't mean the rest of us should continue with carnistic consumption as usual. It's time to break through carnistic denial and take on big ag the way we've taken on big oil. It's time to make animal agriculture a climate priority. Insist that governments and institutions implement policies and practices that are as plant-based as possible, which is necessary for them to be as sustainable as possible. It's time to end climate carnism. Wow, hope you enjoyed that. Wasn't that amazing? And Dr. Melanie Joy is such a brilliant speaker. And if you are available to travel to Washington, D.C. for the 20th to the 23rd of October, please do join us for the AVA Summit. That's the Animal and Vegan Advocacy Summit, where you're going to see and hear from 80 of the most amazing 
speakers in animal rights and vegan advocacy from around the world. Uh, you can get $100 off your ticket today by going to avasummit.com forward slash PBN and using the code PBN100. As always, it's really been great to chat to you guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I really do love doing lives. And so if you want to see more of them, please do let me know. Let us know in the comments. You can comment here on this video or on our YouTube community tab. And you can also get in touch with us at contact at plantbasednews.org if you have any comments or suggestions. As always, please do check out our website at plantbasednews.org for all the latest vegan news and views. Check out our SoundCloud podcast at soundcloud.com forward slash plantbasednews. Blah, blah, I can't speak today. Plantbasednews. Thank you so much for joining us again. I have been your host, Robbie Lockie, and as always,